Hey everybody, Duke DeYoung from Vantage Pro here with Jonathan. Senior technical support That's engineer right. with basically, Yamaha. He's a brilliant dude. That's basically all that matters. But uh, this is like, this is it. This is the new DM7, uh, one of them. So, I mean, talk to us about the family because there is a family. Absolutely, DM7 is a series. We're super excited for this new release. We've got two consoles in the line, a DM7 and a DM7 Compact. Uh, both of them are 96K operation, interoperable between the two. The DM7 comes with 120 input channels. DM7 Compact is a 72 input channel console. Both of them have the same output structure, 48 mixes, 12 matrices, and 24 DCAs plus two stereo buses. Both of these consoles, again, 96K operation. They both ship with a built-in 144 by 144 96K Dante card built-in. In addition, we have a new PY card slot, 64 by 64 at 96K. Brings us way up from maybe an MY 16 by 16 yeah. at 48. This option, uh, we currently have three cards that we're ready with. We have a Maddie 64 by 64 96K dual link with SRC. We also have an AES card as well as a MIDI GPI card, 5-pin MIDI operation, additional GPI contacts. Both of them uh, have local I.O. The DM7 has 32 inputs and 16 outputs. The DM7 Compact has 16 inputs, 16 outputs on the back. Um, AES I.O. on both of them. The DM7 has a 4x4 AES I.O. The DM7 Compact has a 0x2 AES output. So we're standing in front of a Compact right now. That's correct. But there's also this lovely sidecar that's attached to it. Talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, sure is. We're really excited about this as well. New for Yamaha. This is the CTL, the control module that we've got. It's a new piece. It is control only. It is a standard Ethernet Cat5 connection and an IEC for power. Uh, it, it offers the ability to expand your user-defined keys, user-defined encoders, as well as two user-defined faders, a jog wheel, we're bringing the jog wheel back. It's cool again, maybe from PM1D, PM5D <laughs> days, right? This guy is really powerful, really easy to use, and assignable for multiple features based on what you're looking at. Um, it can be on either side of either version of the DM7 series, and it can live on its own as well. So if you want this at front of house, maybe you have some user-defined keys, but you don't want to have Dante audio at front of house. Yeah. Wherever you want this to be, you can drop this in, it's a standard Ethernet connection. There's a two-port switch on the back as well. So you can connect the DM7 to the control module, to your laptop running editor, and it's all over hardwired Ethernet single cable. Yeah, I think the fact that it's all super modular really makes it uh, really kind of powerful for a lot of different applications. Absolutely. Uh, certainly uh, front of house uh, in, in any kind of performance venue, church, mm -hmm. whatnot. Uh, but the fact that you can actually just drop this control module just separately anywhere, it, it kind of gets out of the box a little bit. Yeah, it does. Um, and we offer four SKUs out of the box. So uh, we have the DM7, the DM7 Compact, the DM7 EX, which includes the control module and two pieces of really cool software we'll get into in a minute, okay. as well as the DM7 CEX, which is the same version, just the Compact. Okay. Before we get into features of the console, talk to us about the software, because you guys have been doing some really cool stuff there. Yeah, we're really excited about theater and broadcast software options for DM7 series. They're optional. You can package them. The EX includes that software. You can purchase them separately, and those licenses are portable using Provisionary Cloud. So you can move that license between desks and be able to rotate things around if you need to for whatever use case you might have. The theater software is uh, pa packed with features. We've got uh, actor library, which is a great way to have presets for different actors, different inputs, different people that is recallable uh, on a global level, as well as DCA grid, which is new for us. It's the ability to program DCA scenes for maybe line mixing in a theater application really quickly. You're able to actually track an actor through multiple uh, scenes using the same DCA. If you've got one DCA 10 times on a scenes, you can actually track through, and that means you can update faster as well. If right. you need to replace an actor, add somebody to a DCA, really easy to do so quickly. The broadcast software includes 5.1 surround and a future release, as well as LUFS metering for um, broadcast applications, true loudness metering, multiple types, so you can have the BBC type as standard, right. um, and different sensitivities as well, so you can make sure it's uh, application specific and correct for what you're doing. And the broadcast software, to me, actually has a lot more application outside of even, or sorry, the theater uh, software, mm -hmm. because you, you know you say actor, and actor means specific thing to brought to theater. Yeah. But in a performance venue, in a church in particular, we have a lot of actors on stage, right? We have electric guitarists, we have bass guitarists, and especially if we've got volunteer musicians every week, 
like each of your actors might actually just be a different musician playing the same instrument. Absolutely, or maybe the same person playing different instruments, right? So you've got the ability to replace a guitar if they're, they brought their Strat today, that's fine. Gibson tomorrow, not a problem. You can recall all those presets and you've got predefined EQ, compression, all those things can be recalled very easily. Um, you also maybe have six singers downstage that could be different every week, right? right. Rotating lead <laughs> choir, you can just replace people in. You've got all the presets for all of your different potential singers. You could just drop them in on a day-by-day -day basis. And these, these presets aren't just a, uh, like I've saved their EQ in a library, like it's a full the full processing can be captured, that's correct. Uh, the gain stays separate just because we want to make sure you've got the individual control of gain, but yeah, you're able to recall everything else. And speaking of gain, we've got the ability to have two inputs simultaneously available to the strip. There's an A and a B input now, so you can have a backup microphone potentially for a podium. You can sw uh, switch over to it with a user defined key and everything else stays the same, just a separate head amp control. Yeah, so besides the fact that this thing just looks amazing, I mean, the screen is, probably one of the best screens I've ever seen on yeah. a Yamaha console, which is just sharp as all get out. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of new features packed into this uh, if you're familiar with Yamaha consoles in the past. So give us some of the highlights of some of the kind of the new stuff in this console. Yeah, we did, we took a new approach with this design. The Center Logic's you know, M7 CL, LS9, we've kind of moved up from there. So we're now screen based and that's really where we want to focus our energy. The screen, nice, beautiful glass touch screen, multi-touch as well. Um, the encoders now live below the screen. There's one row of encoders per fader bank per bay. We're able to map these encoders to do anything on screen as well as some fixed applications. When you're in a one channel view of the desk, you're able to look at what you're seeing and touch what you want to control. If you're looking at the EQ, you want to affect the EQ, you touch the EQ section and you might notice that these LEDs are going to change based on what you're doing. So these colors are moving around. That means that these encoders are mapping to whatever processing you're actually working with. So for example, when we have the EQ selected, you might see red, orange, yellow, green, matches the four bands of parametric EQ up the top. Right. If you grab a compressor, if you grab a gate, it all maps that direction. It also works well for maybe mixes. You now have control of 12 mixes from these encoders right on the front of the screen. You also have something called encoder mode, which allows you to basically park the encoders to do one specific thing. Maybe that's a head amp, maybe that's a, a pan. You're able to map five different controls and be able to then grab that. It's always available right at your fingertips. You don't have to go find it on the screen. Well, and I think that's one of the critical things is anytime you're gonna go highly visual based, uh, almost like a giant iPad, right? You've right. gotta have those connectors between the information on screen and the tactile surface. Absolutely. And so being able to match those things color for color gives you kind of a quicker at a glance ability to go, oh, I need that one. Correct, yeah, it's really a way to, to give positive feedback as to what the user is actually working with at any time. You can look down, you might see the rainbow, you might see only orange, you might see only purple. You wanna make sure you understand what you're trashing, what you're right. grabbing quickly as well. You know, you don't wanna to have to always look down. If you can see the colors, right, right. you know what you're working with. So besides that, what are some of the other new features uh, uh, unique to the DM7 line? Yeah, we've got a really cool new feature called split mode. Uh, both the DM7 and the DM7 Compact can be essentially split into two consoles simultaneously, one piece of hardware. So the DM7, again, 120 input channels. When you go into split mode, it makes two 60-channel consoles. Okay. You share the output structure, 12-channel uh, resolution of mixes. You can have 12 and 36, 24 and 24, whatever combination you might need. The matrices and DCAs get split between the two engines, and the two stereo buses become one and one but you're able to have two separate instances of the DM7 software inside of the console running simultaneously, and you're able to switch between the A and the B engine from the screen. You can have on a DM7 both screens looking at one engine or simultaneously having both available. You can also maybe have DM7 control. You can have the Mac OS or Windows application running yeah, yeah. You know, on your computer. You can have both screens set up for the A side. and then maybe as well. Exactly, right. yes, yeah. absolutely. Stage Mix is also doing the same thing. You can select engines, yeah, yeah. be able to run remotely. Maybe you've got both screens running front of house and a monitor guy on stage with an iPad. You can do all of that directly from there. So, so what is that practical application? Because, I mean, the idea of splitting a console in two, you might go, why not just get two consoles? Right, yeah. So it's uh, a price point, right? Uh, uh, approachability, you're able to to save some costs by having one console do two things. Uh, the ability to separate all of your processing is really important, especially maybe for a front of house and a broadcast application. Oh, yeah, yeah. You could have a broadcast guy in a booth on the DM7 editor on a Mac 
you know, just sitting there, being able to, to mix, recall their own scenes. You've got your own scene library. All the processing is discrete. The only thing you share is potentially head amps if you have them patched in both sides. And that's where gain compensation comes in. We're able to digitally trim, not impacting the yeah. other. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm afraid to ask, what else? <laughs> I mean, that's so We've cool. We've taken a couple of features down from Ravage. This really wants to sit between the CLQL and the Ravage. First of all, the 96K operation, yeah, yeah. right? That uh, in, improved sonic performance really makes a difference. We've got refresh preamps in the back of this. This is the console for Rio. Um, Rio D1 and D2 are fully compatible with the DM7 series. Okay. With current firmware, both of them will run at 96K. Okay. You don't have to replace your I.O. If you want to upgrade to DM7, yeah. you can slap it which in. Which is amazing. Yeah, slap it in, a couple of Dante ports, 96K operation with current firmware, which is super exciting. Um, we've got premium racks, just like CLQL series, but now instead we've got 64 DSP slots available to Only the console. Only 64. Only 64, <laughs> up from eight, less than 382. Um, now you've got the ability to patch premiums like your porticos, like your comp 369s, maybe you've got a 276 that you want to add, primary source enhancer on every law of no problem for 32 yeah. channels, yeah. So we're able to bust that in, it's all utilized this direction, you can see your gas gauge up at the top, you know where you're at, you know how much room you have to expand. On top of the 64 premium slots, we've got eight effects legacy Yamaha plugins for any kind of effect engine that you might need and 32 graphic EQs all available at the same time. On top of that, your input channels have some premium dynamic plugins. For example, maybe you've got a Comp 260, and then you want to grab a diode bridge compressor as well, FET limiter, things like that, available at the same time in addition to the premium plugins. Right, right. And as you mentioned earlier, I mean, why you would need more processing, one could ask. <laughs> but you did mention earlier, there, there are still the card slots, and so if you did need to add Waves or any of those other plug-in servers, that's very totally doable. So. Absolutely, yep. This ships standard with VST rack elements. You're able to do external plugins over USB. You could absolutely go uh, sound grid with, with Dante going to Waves that direction. And because the I.O. on the Dante card is higher than the I.O. on the console, you've got the ability to run uh, external plugins uh, yeah, yeah. without stealing any of your input channels. Yeah. And, and I think kind of one of the cool, really underrated screens on this is this window right here because the user-defined presets that you can program in here, like they're pretty deep. Yeah, so the utility screen is a nice sidecar for us to be always available and running its own thing, if you will. You've got all these user-defined keys, got another 48 UDKs on the utility screen, all custom assignable, really easy to program this on the main bay over here on this side as well as on the DM7 full. You've got monitoring here, an A and a B monitor bus. Um, scene list over here, you can have your scene list always up and running. You can see what's next. You can scroll through, recall, store, all those kinds of things are available at all times. Um, save load feature is on this side of the desk, just so you've got the two USB ports above, right, right. you're looking directly at it. As well as with the broadcast software, the LUFS meter is there as well, so you're able to look at what your metering is like without stealing what your console is doing in front. We've also got something new called AI Assist. Okay, I'm it's listening. Brand new feature, <laughs> it is currently in beta. We're really excited about it. There's two different assist types. We have Headamp Assist and Fader Assist. Headamp Assist is this incredible piece of technology that has the ability to intelligently sample an input and it's going to take a guess at what it is. So if you show up to a gig, don't have a console file, you just want to get going, right? Plug everything in, get it turned on turn on HA Assist. What it's gonna do is sample those inputs. It'll do its best to label it. It'll set the head amp. Then if you go to fader mode, you can have it intelligently attempt to mix those inputs together into four groups. That's terrifying. It's amazing. We wanna kinda of call it a third arm, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's the ability to have the piece of software behind the console built into the console, no internet connection needed, oh running goodness. at the same time. Yeah, it's really impressive what so it's, it's like able to do. it's like the festival starter. Yeah. It's Basically. Essentially, yeah. No, so. that's cool. And I can see some real good application in that, like head up control especially. I know a lot of times when we're in churches and, and we've got volunteer audio guys, gain seems to be one of the hardest things to kind of get right. And so being able to set some parameters, hit auto gain, having it like dial in and then turning it off, yep. it's like, oh my gosh, what a lifesaver for everybody, especially the monitors, all the monitors, like now their gains are right, their levels are good. Absolutely, yeah, we're taking this, you can kind of think of TF where there was the gas gauge of a yeah. head amp control. This is 
automated. It's, it's really designed to find a target uh, voltage range for it. It wants to get everything into a sweet spot on the desk. So you've got things set for you before you even start. We'll talk more about this in other times, but like my head's already exploded. <laughs> so, I mean, there's just so much cool stuff in the DM7. Um, We'd love to talk to you more about it. If it fits your, your application, uh, it, there's just a lot of horsepower here. So uh, visit us on our website, uh, VantageProAV.com, or if you want to reach out to us, uh, hit us up, uh, hello at VantageProAV.com.